Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 50. Verses 32 through 42. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh, and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, Sleepest thou? Could not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away, and prayed, and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest, it's enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Burkett notes, Our blessed Savior, being now come with his disciples into the garden, he falls there into a bitter and bloody agony, in which he prayed with wonderful fervency and importunity to his heavenly Father. His sufferings were now coming on at great pace, and he meets them upon his knees, and would be found in a praying posture. Learn hence that prayer is the best preparative for, as well as the most powerful support under, the heaviest sufferings that can befall us. As to the prayer of our Savior in the garden, many things are here very observable. As first, the place where he prayed, the garden. But why went Christ thither, not with our first parents, to hide himself there among the trees of the garden from the notice and observation of his enemies, but as a garden was a place where our misery began, as the first scene of human sin and misery was acted in a garden, so does our Lord choose a garden for the fittest place, for his agony and satisfactory pains to begin in. Again, this garden was a place of privacy and retirement, where our Lord might best attend the offices of devotion preparatory to his passion. St. John 18.2 tells us that Jesus oftentimes resorted to this garden with his disciples, and that Judas well knew the place. It is evident, then, that Christ went not into the garden to shun his sufferings, but to prepare himself by prayer to meet his enemies. Observe, too, the time when he entered into the garden for prayer. It was in the evening before he suffered. Here he spent some hours in pouring forth his soul to God. For about midnight Judas, with his black guard, came and apprehended him in a praying posture. Our Lord, teaching us by his example, that when eminent dangers are before us, especially when death is apprehended by us, to be very much in prayer to God and very fervent in our wrestlings with him. Observe three, the matter of our Lord's prayer, that if possible, the cup might pass from him, and he might be kept from the hour of suffering, that his soul might escape that dreadful wrath at which he was so sore amazed. But what, did Christ then begin to repent of his undertaking for sinners? Did he shrink and give back when it came to the pinch? No, nothing less. But as he had two natures, being God and man, so he had two distinct wills. As man, he feared and shunned death. As God-man, he willingly submitted to it. The divine nature and the human spirit of Christ did now assault each other with disagreeing interests. Again, this prayer was not absolute, but conditional. If it be possible, Father, if it may be. If thou art willing, if it please thee, let this cup pass. If not, I will drink it. The cup of sufferings we see is a very bitter and distasteful cup, a cup which human nature abhors and cannot desire, but pray against. Yet God doth put this bitter cup of affliction into the hands oft times of those whom he doth sincerely love, and when he doth so, it is their duty to drink it with silence and submission, as here their Lord did before them. Father, let the cup pass, yet not my will, but thine be done. Observe 4. The manner of our Lord's prayer in the garden. 
And here we may remark, one, it was a solitary prayer. He went by himself alone, out of hearing of his disciples. The company of our best and dearest friends is not always seasonable. There's a time to be solitary as well as to be sociable. There are times and cases when a Christian would not be willing that the most intimate friend he has in the world should be with him to hear what passes in secret between him and his God. Two, it was a humble prayer, as evident by the postures into which he cast himself, sometimes kneeling, sometimes lying prostrate upon his face. He lies in the very dust, and lower he cannot lie, and his heart was as low as his body. Three, it was a vehement, fervent, an almost importune prayer. Such was the fervor of the Lord's spirit that he prayed himself into an agony. Oh, let us blush to think how unlike we are to Christ in prayer as to our praying frame of spirit. Lord, what deadness and drowsiness, what stupidity and formality, what dullness and laziness is found in our prayers. How often do our lips move and our hearts stand still. For it was a reiterated and repeated prayer. He prayed the first, second, and third time for the passing of the cup from him. He returns upon God over and over again, resolving to take no denial. Let us be not discouraged, though we have sought God often for a particular mercy, and yet no answer has been given unto us. Our prayers may be answered, though their answer for the present is suspended. A prayer put up in faith, according to the will of God, though it may be delayed, it shall not be lost. Our Savior prayed the first, second, and third time for the passing of the cup, and although he was not heard as to exemption from suffering, yet he was heard as to support under suffering. Observe 5. The posture the disciples were found in when our Lord was in this agony, praying to his Father. They were fast asleep. Good God, could they possibly sleep at such a time as that was, when Christ's soul was exceedingly sorrowful? Could their eyes be thus heavy? Learn hence that the best of Christ's disciples may be, and oft times are, overtaken with infirmities, with great infirmities, when the most important duties are performing. He cometh to his disciples and finds them sleeping. Observe 6. The mild and gentle reproof which he gives his disciples for their sleeping. Could ye not watch with me one hour? Could ye not watch when your master was in such danger? Could ye not watch with me? When I am going to deliver up my life for you, what, not one hour, and that the parting hour too. After his reprehension, he subjoins an exhortation, watch and pray that ye not enter into temptation, and superadds a forcible reason, for although the spirit be willing, yet the flesh is weak. Thence learn that the holiest and best resolved Christians, who have willing spirits for Christ and his service, yet in regard of the weakness of the flesh, or the frailty of human nature, It is their duty to watch and pray, and thereby guard themselves against temptation. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, for though the spirit is willing, yet the flesh is weak. Verses 43 through 50. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him, and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straight away to him, and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him, and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword, and smote a servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. Burkett notes, The hour is now almost come, even the hour of sorrow, which Christ had so often spoken of. Yet a little while, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. For while he yet spake, cometh Judith with a band of soldiers to apprehend him. It was the lot and portion of our dear Redeemer to be betrayed into the hands of his mortal enemies by the treachery of a false and dissembling friend. Here we have observable, one, the traitor, two, the treason, three, the manner how, four, the time when this treasonable design was executed. Observe one, the traitor, Judas. 
All the evangelists carefully describe him by his name, Judas, by his surname, Judas Iscariot, lest he should be mistaken for Jude, the brother of James. Almighty God takes great care to preserve the names of his upright-hearted servants. He is farther described by his office, one of the twelve. The eminency of his place and station was a high aggravation to his transgression. Learn hence that the greatest professors had need to be very jealous of themselves and suspicious of their own hearts, and look well to the grounds and principles of their profession. For a profession begun in hypocrisy will certainly end in apostasy. Learn farther that persons are never in such imminent danger as when they meet with temptations exactly suited to their master lusts. Covetousness was Judas's master sin. The love of the world made him a slave to Satan, and the devil lays a temptation before him exactly suited to his temper and inclination, and it constantly overcomes him. Oh, pray we, that we may be kept from a strong and suitable temptation, a temptation suited to our inclinations and predominant lusts and corruptions. Observe, too, the treason of this traitor Judas. He led on an armed multitude to the place where Christ was, gave them a signal to discover him by, and bids them lay hands upon him and hold him fast. Some conjure that when Judas bade them hold Christ fast, he thought they could not do it, but that as Christ had at other times conveyed himself from the multitude when they attempted to kill or stone him, so he would have done now. But his hour was now come, and accordingly he suffers himself to be delivered by the treachery of Judas into his enemy's hands. And this, his treason, is attended with these hellish aggravations. He had been a witness to the miracles which our Savior had wrought by his divine power, and therefore could not sin out of ignorance. What he did was not at the solicitation and persuasion of others, but he was a volunteer in this service. The high priests did not send to him, but he went to them, offering his assistance. No doubt it was a matter of surprise to the chief priests to find one of Christ's own disciples at the head of a conspiracy against him. Lord, how dangerous it is to allow ourselves in any one secret or open sin. None can say how far that one sin may in time lead us. Should any have told Judas that his love of money would at last make him sell his Savior, he would have said with Hazel, Is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? That soul can never be safe that harbors one sin within its breast. Observe 3. The manner how this hellish plot was executed, partly by force and partly by fraud. By force, in the Judas came with a multitude armed with swords and staves, and by fraud, giving a kiss and saying, Hail, Master. Here was honey in the lips, but poison in the heart. Observe 4. The time when, the place where, and the work which our Savior was about when this treasonable design was executed. He was in the garden with his disciples, exhorting them to prayer and watchfulness, dropping heavenly advice and comfort upon them. While he yet spake, lo, Judas came. Our Savior was found in the most heavenly and excellent employment when his enemies came to apprehend him. Lord, how happy it is when our sufferings find us in God's way, engaged in his work and engaging his assistance by fervent supplication. Thus did our Lord's suffering meet with him. May ours, in like manner, meet us. Observe 5. The endeavors used by the disciples for their master's rescue. One of them, St. Matthew says it was Peter, draws his sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, who probably was one of the forwardest to lay hands on Christ. But why did not St. Peter draw upon Judas rather than Malchus? Because, though Judas was more faulty, yet Malchus was more forward to arrest and carry off our Savior. How doth a pious breast swell with indignation at the sight of any open affront offered to its Savior? Yet though St. Peter's heart was sincere, his hand was rash. Good intentions are no warrant for irregular actions. And accordingly, Christ, who accepted the affection, reproves the action. Put up thy sword, for they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. Christ will thank no man to fight for him without warrant and commission from him. To resist a lawful magistrate in Christ's own defense is rash zeal and uncountenanced by the gospel. Observe, lastly, the effect which our Savior's apprehension had upon the disciples. They all forsook him and fled. They that said to Christ a little while before, Though we should die with thee, yet we will not deny thee, 
to hear all desert and cowardly forsake him when it came to the trial. Learn hence that the best and holiest of men know not their own hearts when great temptations and trials are before them until such a time as they come to grapple with them. No man knows his own strength till temptation puts it to the proof.